and welcome to The World This Week. I'm Beverly O'Connor. Coming up, the military seizes power in Myanmar and detains the country's elected leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. International outrage after Russia jails opposition leader Alexei Navalny for violating parole. And a British hero of the pandemic, Captain Sir Tom Moore, dies after contracting coronavirus. Well, Myanmar's elected leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, remains under house arrest after the country's military seized power this week in a coup. The country's fragile democracy is in tatters while Ms Suu Kyi has been charged with illegally importing communications equipment. Our Southeast Asia correspondent, Mazoe Ford, reports. Disquiet is growing in Myanmar's biggest city. For a second night, the sound of dissent could be heard on the streets of Yangon. This coup is an insult. People were living peacefully and things were stable. Images of protesting health workers were shared on social media before the junta announced it was blocking Facebook to ensure stability. But members of Aung San Suu Kyi's party are urging calm. There'd be a clash if we took to the streets. Then the military would use that as a reason to extend and legitimise the coup. The 75-year-old deposed leader has been charged with illegally importing walkie-talkies. If convicted, it'll mean she can't stand in next year's elections. The charges filed against her just compound the undermining of the, the rule of law. International calls are mounting for the release of those detained. We don't want the military, chanted expats in Bangkok. While in Tokyo, thousands called for action. The UN Secretary-General wants world leaders to ensure this coup fails. We're continuing to uh, review sanction, our sanctions authorities and other options. But the Security Council may struggle for support from China, a key ally and investor in Myanmar. What's being said is not true. As Myanmar's friendly neighbour, we wish that all sides can appropriately resolve their differences. In the meantime, government officials have been sent packing. Tanks roll through the streets and Aung San Suu Kyi is being kept out of public view. Mazoe Ford, ABC News. Russia's opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been jailed for three and a half years. The Moscow court ruled it was a violation of parole when he was taken to Germany to recover after being poisoned last year. Here's Europe correspondent Linton Besser. Defiant but resigned to his fate. The aim of this hearing is to scare a great number of people. They jail one man to scare millions. In a speech to the court, Russia's opposition leader called President Vladimir Putin a killer. No matter how much he pretends to be a great politician, he'll go down in history as a poisoner. The Moscow court ordered Alexei Navalny serve more than two and a half years in a penal colony, taking into account time already served. His crime, violating parole while recovering in Germany after being poisoned with a Russian nerve agent. His lawyers say they'll appeal. With Alexei Navalny locked away, Vladimir Putin continued the crackdown on his supporters. They took to the streets in Moscow and St Petersburg, fearless in the face of beatings and detention. The greatest political threat in decades, Alexei Navalny has deeply embarrassed the Kremlin, fueling discontent as ordinary Russians struggle with an economic downturn, the coronavirus pandemic and widespread corruption. International reaction to his sentence was swift. We are going to look very carefully uh, at the deteriorating human rights uh, situation in Russia. The front page of this independent Russian newspaper warns you can't jail the whole country. But Vladimir Putin's iron grip shows no sign of loosening. Linton Besser, ABC News. Well, with just under six months to go until the Tokyo Olympics, a COVID playbook has been released showing how the Games will function during the pandemic. But with more than 15,000 competitors expected to fly in, locals still aren't convinced the event can be held safely. Here's North Asia correspondent Jake Sturmer in Tokyo. 
Organisers have spent the last year running tests and trials to figure out how to hold the game safely in the middle of a pandemic. Now they think they've worked it out. There will be a number of constraints and conditions uh, that the participants will have to respect and follow. The International Olympic Committee has released a playbook for officials and people in close contact with athletes. It includes restrictions on public transport, cheering, chanting, singing, hugs and high fives. Those who don't comply could be kicked out. It's not yet known if spectators will even be allowed at the Games, but athletes are learning to roll with the punches. Let's be honest, if I swim in front of nobody, I've got my head underwater most of the time, I've no idea what's happening. Like, you, you can't hear anything. The release of this book is part of a campaign to shift the narrative from one of fear and uncertainty to hope, to show that organisers have learnt much more about the virus in the last 12 months and from the many sporting events that have been held successfully in that time. But the document is light on detail on questions like what would happen if a team member tests positive. Tokyo is still under a state of emergency and hospitals in Japan are stretched. The idea of thousands of foreign athletes and fans coming here and potentially spreading the virus means many don't want the games to go ahead here in July. And as if Japan's organising committee didn't have enough problems, its president Yoshiro Mori is now under fire for making sexist remarks at a board meeting of the Japanese Olympic Committee, saying that female directors talked too much, which he found annoying. This is discrimination and prejudice against women, this lone protester yelled, just one of a growing crowd calling for President Mori's resignation. The statement I made was an inappropriate expression. Contrary to the spirit of the Olympics, I am deeply remorseful. Just one more problem to address, with a little under six months to go until the opening ceremony. Jake Sturmer, ABC News, Tokyo. In the global scramble for vaccines, some authorities are pitching so-called immunity passports to fast-track international travel. The passport would take the form of an app on your phone that would be linked to your ID and vaccination status. But health experts say the idea is risky and privacy advocates have their own concerns. Here's our Europe correspondent, Nick Dole. After a year of border closures, an island getaway might feel like a distant dream, but there is hope on the horizon and travel companies can barely contain their excitement. So you could jab and go. As more and more people are protected, European countries are weighing up the merits of so-called vaccination or immunity passports. Tech companies are lining up to offer what they say could be a path back to normal life. It would also create an incentive for people to get vaccinated because they could do things that they otherwise couldn't do. While passengers are used to ID checks at airports, there's no telling where the concept could lead. I go back to simple examples of like free walk into a pub, are you old enough to drink? So if we can make it similar to that flash little ID check that we do for our age, which is a basic permission attribute, this just becomes another permission attribute. But while the major vaccines are proven to reduce the risk of serious illness, their ability to stop a person from spreading the virus isn't so clear. It's risky because we don't have enough information. Actually, sort of from an immunological point of view, you would probably expect a vaccine would stop you getting infected. That's what we would expect. But the, the problem is we just don't have that evidence yet. This particular app scans your facial features and creates a biometric signature that can be linked in the cloud to your vaccination status. While it could be a quick and easy way to check who's inoculated, even those developing this kind of technology admit it risks widening the gap between the haves and the have-nots. There are real public issues associated with the creation of two-tier of, of, of two societies. Critics say it will put poorer countries even further behind if they don't have access to vaccines or the technology to make the passports work. And privacy advocates fear the facial recognition data could be used for law enforcement. Once the data is available, the database is created, the temptation is there to say, oh, but it exists, why don't we use it for this purpose? As long as you control who you send the information to, you're in control of your data, it sits on your phone or your device, there's no real risk there. Even still, it's a risk many may be willing to take to get back on the move. Nick Dole, ABC News, London. 
Fiji is dealing with an unfolding crisis days after being pummeled by another devastating cyclone. In some regions, floodwaters have destroyed homes, cut power and left food and water in short supply. Locals are desperate for help from Australia. Sydney's Fijian community is doing what it can. In the heart of town, locals watched in disbelief on Sunday as floodwaters rose. Others tried to escape tropical cyclone Anna's grip as it engulfed their homes. The Australian Defence Force just returned to Sydney following a three-week recovery operation, but the recent cyclone has renewed calls for aid. We are just uh, uh, seeking help. Mr Kumar's sugarcane farm is one of thousands on the island that has lost crops. The island nation is already suffering. 40% of its GDP normally comes from tourism. Half of that is thanks to Australian visitors. If today you say to me you'd like to send 10,000 tourists, I'll, you know, I'll give you a big hug. <laughs> Fiji hasn't had a local COVID case for almost 300 days. It wants a travel bubble with Australia, but it appears talks have stalled. It would be uh, wonderful if the Australian government uh, expedited these discussions uh, to get the borders open. For when that will happen is anyone's guess, but for now there are more immediate concerns. Waterborne diseases are spreading with children most at risk. Here in Australia, their calls for help are being heard. Sydney's Fijian community is rallying after receiving desperate pleas from the island nation. The emotions are very high. They're crying out for help, food, educational material. Them knowing that, you know, we're here to help them, we're here to support them. That's what we can do. And even hard borders won't stand in the way. Rani Heyman, ABC News. Scott Morrison has confirmed he will attend Joe Biden's climate summit later this year. The Prime Minister had his first phone call with Mr Biden since the US President's inauguration two weeks ago. Here's our foreign affairs reporter Stephen Jejitz. A ringing endorsement of a long-standing alliance. Two weeks after inauguration, Joe Biden phones Scott Morrison. We are in this together. We are absolutely in this together. A relationship both countries call unbreakable. The anchor for peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. We look forward to a strengthening of the relationship between our two great democracies. But there are also signs of strain. Today is climate day at the White House. The Biden administration has embraced ambitious new targets to cut emissions. In my view, we've already waited too long to deal with this climate crisis. We can't wait any longer. Joe Biden wants Scott Morrison to attend a climate conference in April designed to press major polluters to pledge deeper cuts to pollution. We spoke positively about these, these initiatives and so uh, we look forward to being able to participate. But the Prime Minister insists the President did not demand that Australia sign up right now to a target of net zero emissions by 2050. We had a very positive discussion about uh, the path we're on. It's time for Scott Morrison to stop sort of trying to straddle both sides of the fence here and unambiguously make that commitment. At the very bare minimum, they'll be looking for a long-term signal to actually get to net zero, 2050 if not sooner. They'll be looking for more action over the next 10 years. <gasps> The two leaders also discussed Beijing, although the details are being tightly held by both sides. A White House spokesperson cited dealing with China as a challenge, on par with climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. The Australian government might agree with that, but it probably wouldn't say so publicly. Stephen Jejitz, ABC News, Canberra. India has accused celebrities of sensationalism after singer Rihanna and climate activist Greta Thunberg spoke out about the country's farming protests. Here's Jordan Butler. On the outskirts of New Delhi, farmers are hoping there is strength in numbers. All our farmer brothers are together and are going to get their rights and going to get their three demands fulfilled. They're going to force this government to step down. For two months now, protesters have been calling for the government's agricultural reforms, which allow big retailers to buy directly from growers to be scrapped. But the government says it will help them and that it's only a small group of farmers who have reservations. 
The government has a misunderstanding that the people participating in Delhi's farmers' protests are not farmers. It's impossible to take all the farmers to Delhi. These meetings are to wake up the government. Their plight has caught the eye of global pop star Rihanna, tweeting her support to her 101 million followers asking, why aren't we talking about this? Hashtag farmers' protests. It's caused quite a stir online, prompting a global outpouring of support from other popular figures, including climate activists Greta Thunberg and US Vice President Kamala Harris's niece, Mina Harris. But the celebrity spotlight has angered officials. In a statement addressing the tweets, the country's external affairs ministry says the temptation of sensationalist social media hashtags and comments, especially when resorted to by celebrities and others, is neither accurate nor responsible. The farmers' protest made headlines last week when a rally ended in violent clashes that left one protester dead and hundreds of police injured. Despite Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government offering to suspend the laws for 18 months, farmers are insisting it be repealed. They have every right to speak and the government has no right to clamp down on the voice of the farmers just to favour few crony corporates. But with no sign the reforms could be thrown out, their fight continues. Jordan Butler, ABC News. Indonesia has begun rolling out a second dose of Sinovac shot and the government is prioritising younger people to get people back to work. But that means the over 65s are missing out. Our Indonesia correspondent Ann Barker explains. Maria Irene Pusperini has barely left her home since the pandemic spread to Indonesia. The 80-year-old knows she's in the age group most likely to die from COVID-19. I'm old, so I'm super careful. When Indonesia began its mass immunisation program, she was ready to sign up, but she's too old. I want to get vaccinated, but the vaccine for old people hasn't arrived yet. In Indonesia, 15% of people who've died from COVID are over 60. But unlike in countries where they're prioritised for vaccination, Indonesia is excluding them. Health workers and frontline responders are first in line, then working age Indonesians between 18 to 59. It will protect them so they can work to feed their families and get the economy moving. And immunising younger workers they hope will help protect the elderly because so many live in extended families. But there are safety reasons too. Indonesia's trial of the Sinovac vaccine didn't include anyone over 60. We need more data on the safety of this vaccine for those over 60 or other vaccines that are proven to be safe. But some epidemiologists disagree. Sinovac uses an inactivated virus, an approach that has been used for decades on children and adults. There is no dangerous reaction. Indonesia has ordered smaller supplies of the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines, but they won't arrive for months. And there are now efficacy concerns about AstraZeneca's vaccine for the elderly as well, meaning it could be a long while before Maria Irene Pusperini can again leave her home in safety. Anne Barker, ABC News. Returning to the coup in Myanmar and the fate of Aung San Suu Kyi, Michael Vincent looks back at her life and how her once pristine image as a champion of human rights has been tarnished in recent times. Aung San Suu Kyi was once considered a beacon of democracy in Asia and a prized picture opportunity for Western leaders. Suu Kyi is the daughter of Myanmar's founding father, Aung San, but she was exiled after the military seized control in 1962. Educated at Oxford, she didn't return home for more than 20 years. She finally came back to Myanmar in 1988, but during the course of 1988, as this terrific revolt uh, occurred against the military authority, she seized her opportunity and became the leader of the, of, of, of the budding democracy movement. It can't go on forever. 
for very long, and if the government is sensible, they should bring it. They should bring it to, to an end very quickly by forming an interim government which is acceptable to the people. World leaders have acclaimed the courage of this year's Nobel Peace Prize winner. I feel that this is what my father would have wanted me to do. He very much believes that every man should, should discharge his duty towards the nation. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 91, and I, I thought then, and I, I still continue to think, that it was a very uh, appropriate reward for somebody who had shown incredible courage as an individual. Su Chi endured home detention on and off over two decades in a bid to secure democracy through non-violent protest. Helpless people, people who have nothing on their side, are frightened of people with guns. That is only natural. But the more lawless the government becomes, the more supportive the people become. During the period of time, during the 1990s, uh, she was really seen as a saint. Uh, she was seen as a, a martyr for democracy and human rights. Released from detention in 2010, six years later, she was elected as a national leader, but had to accept a power-sharing deal with the military. Times have changed, and I think there are a great number of people within the military who wish to be uh, an army that is honoured and respected and trusted by the people. But in 2016, the ethnic cleansing of Muslim Rohingyas shocked the world. 700,000 Rohingya Muslims were driven from Myanmar during a brutal army crackdown. Thousands were killed. Will you continue to deny genocide? Then in 2019, Suu Kyi appeared before the International Court of Justice in The Hague to defend Myanmar's military against charges of genocide. Surely, under the circumstances, genocidal intent cannot be the only hypothesis. I think it was profoundly shocking to us looking on, and profoundly disappointing. Her appearance in The Hague was seen domestically by her supporters in the country as being Aung San Suu Kyi once again going out on a limb to defend her country. And so, in fact, it did her a lot of good politically. I, one might cynically uh, think that that's why she did it. As her popularity abroad plummeted, at home it soared, last November achieving a thumping victory in elections, only for the military to stage a fresh coup and put Suu Kyi back into detention. I think there is absolutely no faulting her courage um, as an individual and as a, as a political leader. I think what one has a problem with is her political judgment. Yeah. It is a, the sad tragedy of Burmese politics that we have an unaccountable military that thinks it, it should rule. Uh, we have a politician who has the support of the people, but not the courage to always use it. And I think that uh, we have an international community that's more worried about what China's doing in Burma than uh, standing up for democracy and human rights principles like they should. One of the heroes of the UK's pandemic response, Captain Sir Tom Moore, has died after contracting coronavirus. The 100-year-old raised $60 million for health service workers on the front line by walking laps of his garden. The British Prime Minister and Queen Elizabeth led the tributes to the World War II veteran whose exploits won global admiration. Our Europe correspondent, Nick Dole. Refusing to sit idle during the pandemic, Captain Tom Moore got off his couch and started walking. He planned to complete 100 laps of his garden before his 100th birthday and raise a bit of money for the National Health Service along the way. By the time he was finished, he'd raised $60 million and captured the hearts of the nation. I'm delighted that we've got so much money for such a good cause. When he turned 100, he received 140,000 birthday cards. The regimental medal. He was made an honorary colonel, and in July, at a special ceremony at Windsor Castle, he was knighted. I think Sir Thomas sounds very nice, um, but I, 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 inside I haven't changed. Nothing, nothing's changed inside. The Queen sent a personal note of condolence to the veteran's family, recognising the inspiration he provided for the whole nation. Captain Sir Tom Moore, 
was a hero in the truest sense of the word. In the face of this country's deepest post-war crisis, he united us all. This news is a blow to morale in a country that's still struggling to deal with an evolving threat. The government's announced there's now a new mutation in the UK variant, which, like the South African one, may make vaccines less effective. Captain Sir Tom Moore never got his vaccine because he'd contracted pneumonia in recent weeks. The healthcare workers he raised so much money for released a charity single last year. It's bound to get a lot more play as Britons say a final thank you. What an extraordinary life. Well, with the Lunar New Year not far away, festivities have been scaled back or cancelled completely due to the pandemic. The disruption has left many Dragon Downs troops without any work. Here's Jason Fang. The year of the rat is drawing to a close, and for many of Australia's Dragon Dance troops, it's been a long one. Well, we've had no income since, <laughs> since Chinese New Year last year. Melbourne's Hongde Lion Dance Association is about to endure its second Lunar New Year, impacted by the pandemic. We were actually, during the first weekend of Chinese New Year, travelling to Glen Waverley to a restaurant to perform, and on the way there, the owner rang me and said, look, we have, I've got no customers tonight so that don't come. Like many of us, the group found ways to stay connected. We did training online through Zoom and we sent each other videos and we watched performances together and analysed things a lot, a lot more, the more technical side of line dancing. Most dance troops like this one have been forced to cancel their regular trainings due to the pandemic. But many are now back just in time for the Lunar New Year celebrations. So it's starting to pick up again. We're getting some bookings coming in again. People are more confident. We're pretty lucky to be able to do line dance for Chinese New Year this year. Uh, a lot of my teams that I know in Malaysia, uh, United States, they can't perform. <laughs> In Bendigo, one of Victoria's oldest lion dance troops also found new ways to keep busy. So we have to switch to online, spend another like 10 minutes to do the, uh, to, to actually learn the Mandarin, you know, learn the Chinese words uh, rather oh. than the actual uh, uh, physical training. Now with training back in full swing, these teams are looking forward to a prosperous new year. So the year of the ox, uh, this is actually belong to the metal, metal ox. So metal ox meaning golden ox, going to be a very good for our financial aspect. The year of the ox, promising to be better than the last one. Jason Fang, ABC News. And that is the programme. You can head to the ABC's World News page for all the latest international headlines and join me on the World Weeknights on the ABC News channel. I'm Bev O'Connor. Thanks so much for your company. Bye-bye.